So welcome to Grand Rounds today. We have the unbelievable pleasure of learning about the slave labor that uh, Shamima has performed this last year. Um, I believe she's the most prolific cornea fellow ever, at least in my long tenure here, in terms of putting out um, research papers. Um, but also she's someone who I think each resident would vouch as someone who's an excellent teacher who really cares about uh, people's education. Uh, despite only being here one year, she's, she's really become, um, I don't know, kind, kind of a member of the resident family in a sense, and that doesn't always happen with fellows. Uh, she was recently married uh, after <laughs> a long search, and she's still happy. <laughs> um, but they are living apart, and. I think that's one of the big reasons why they're so happy, because <laughs> my wife is happier when I'm away. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Sickler. Thank you for that memorable introduction. Um, it is a pleasure for me to present this morning. I really do appreciate all of you coming in. Um, it's nice to present in June. You kind of have the whole year to look back. And it's been an amazing year. And I hope that over the course of the next hour, um, you all are able to appreciate some of the wonderful opportunities that I've been able to participate in and how I feel very, very lucky to have been a fellow here at the Moran over the past year. Um, so basically, we all know that this fellowship is awesome, and so I just wanted to take a moment to step back and sort of uh, quantify how amazing it is. This is a little sample of some of the surgeries that I've been able to do this past year. And so I think um, Dr. Olson picked up on the highlight of the slide. There were eight globes, and seven of them were with Dr. Slade. Um, so it's been an honor and a privilege to close globes with you, Dr. Slade. I think you'll be on call at the beginning of the year because you are like the resident expert. And uh, hopefully you can share some of the pearls that uh, we've shared listening to Lady Gaga on Pandora while closing globes. Uh, so it's been very, very entertaining. Um, and then actually the eighth glo globe was with Bryce, and so that was an honor to help close Bryce's first globe. So, um, But it's been a great year, as you can see, lots and lots of surgery, and this is definitely one of the reasons why um, this was such an attractive fellowship. But um, there's another component that I didn't quite realize was so enticing about this fellowship, and that's the opportunity to engage in research. So as of today, I've submitted 16 papers and nine have been accepted. And technically, if Dr. Oberg and Dr. Holt kind of finish up the last round, we'll submit two more papers this week. Um, and I had the opportunity to be involved in two ARVO posters. I had two invited papers, and I gave two talks at Asterisk, which was a first for me. So that was a delight. And so what I'd like to do is sort of go through some of the papers that have been accepted and share with you a little bit about that experience. So the first paper was actually accepted into JRS. And this was a prospective study looking at um, artisan iris-supported phacic IOLs wells in patients with keratoconus. And so the uh, interesting thing about this paper is it looked at 13 patients with 16 eyes, and these patients were defined as having stable keratoconus, um, defined not only by keratometry but also refraction. And there were a number of reasons why these patients were considered a good candidate for these phacic IOLs, wells, which are, um, as most of you know, inserted through the anterior chamber and clipped to the iris. Um, here in the U.S., it's also marketed as varicize, um, although abroad it's uh, marketed as artisan, simply reflecting the difference in manufacturers. And so these patients were found to be contact lens intolerant or simply did not like wearing the strong prescription glasses that they needed. And so in these 16 eyes, 14 received um, just the standard phacic IOL, and two actually received toric IOLs. And it's important to note that toric artisan um, phacic IOLs are not available yet in the U.S., and this study was conducted in Iran. Um, which was nice to sort of start off the year with an international collaboration. And so here looking at our um, data, you can sort of see the range that these patients experience. I mean, the vision, uh, visual acuity was on the order of correctable to 2020, usually 2020 to about 2040, but the range of power ranged from minus nine all the way up to a minus 22 and a half. And so clearly these are patients who um, really benefited from insertion of these lenses, and you can see postoperatively, their uncorrected visual acuity ranged from the 2020 to 2060 range, although even the 2060 patient could be correctable, um, with relatively low residual refraction postoperatively. So all in all, all the patients had a final visual acuity of 2040 or better, and about 85% had a, a final corrected visual acuity of 2032 or better. 
So in this paper, we, c we concluded that pachyc eye wall implantation is effective for treating these patients with stable keratoconus who are usually contact lens intolerant. All right, moving on to paper number two. Um, so what we uh, had the opportunity to do was review a um, prospective contralateral study, which was done here at the University of Utah, looking at patients who received PRK, photorefractive keratectomy, versus patients who received thin flap LASIK. And in this study, thin flap LASIK was defined as creating a flap with the interlaced laser of approximately 90 microns. And so in this paper, we were able to compare and contrast the visual outcomes. And so uh, overall, there were 52 eyes that we looked at, 26 had PRK, and 26 had thin flap LASIK. In looking at the post-operative data, as to be expected, there was a visually, uh, there, was a vi there was a statistically significant outcome in the visual acuity at the post-operative month one, namely with the LASIK patients doing better compared to the PRK patients. That in and of itself is hardly a surprise. However, as we continue looking at post-operatives months three and six, the um, difference no longer is statistically significant, and we see that the outcomes were great between the two groups. And as far as predictability and safety, the outcomes were similar. Um, we looked at contrast sensitivity as one of the factors as far as outcomes, and you can see here graphically that the um, contrast sensitivity was similar between the two groups. An interesting thing that we looked at were higher order aberrations. Most people consider higher order aberrations to increase after um, laser treatment, and we can see that that generally was the case consistently with PRK and LASIK. And most notably, the total higher order aberration in the spheres increased postoperatively, whereas tree fall was pretty much consistent both pre and postoperatively as well. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so moving on to project number three, I think I'm going to finish very quickly because I seem to be speaking in dictation mode. But um, so the next project we looked at was a series of patients who had iris fixated phacic intraocular lenses. And it was interesting because these patients presented with um, decompensation of their cornea. And so taking a step back, Dr. Moshefar has a lot of experience with these phacic IOLs um, that are clipped to the iris. And in general, in his experience, which reflects sort of the FDA experience, iris decom or sorry, corneal decompensation is not common. However, these were cases that were done by outside ophthalmologists that presented to us. And as far as the management was concerned, uh, as far as uh, the cases that we looked at, there were two cases at that time of um, patients who had had iris fixated intraocular lenses, and they were noted to have corneal decomposition at 22 and 36 months, which are pretty far out from initial implantation. At presentation, their visual acuity was approximately count fingers or 2400 um, in each patient, and these pa one patient an underwent uh, phacic IOL explantation with the concurrent DSEC at the time of surgery, and another patient underwent explantation with phaco emulsification of their lens because of cataractus changes that were noted with a concurrent DSEC surgery. And postoperatively, both patients were actually noted to have vision of 2050. And so this just sort of highlights how we're able to efficiently treat endothelial disease when we sort of bring it on with our surgical treatment. Okay. Yes, please. You know, it Dr. McKeon? No, it wasn't dislocated. No. There actually is. And 
actually on Dr. Moshfar's service, we did see a patient on whom Dr. Moshfar had operated who was lost to follow-up and he had a change in insurance and so when he finally decided to come in because his vision was a little bit blurry, we were able to see that inferiorly he did have some decomposition and that was more when the lens was being placed sort of clipped inferior superiorly and so it, ne it wasn't dislocated as far as removal from the actual <coughs> iris but you could see that there was perhaps some contact that was happening and then he did later admit that he did rub his eyes a bit. Um, and it didn't require any surgical intervention, we just monitored him and he was able to sort of overcome that localized decompensation. Um, okay, so we'll slow down a little bit and talk about this uh, project, which was sort of one of the highlights of my fellowship, um, ultra-thin Desme stripping endothelial repair to plasty donor tissue preparation and profile analysis. So um, basically the principle here is everyone is sort of seeking to make thinner tissue for a desec or for endothelial keratoplasty and of course the endpoint marker for that is decimase membrane endothelial keratoplasty where you're simply transplanting decimase membrane and the endothelium. This of course in principle sounds wonderful, in practice is quite challenging and so in order to sort of approach the benefits of um, DMEX surgery which are believed to be transplanting thinner tissue which allows for less interface issues as far as stromal stromal interaction and theoretically just transplanting the tissue that needs to be transplanted, um, we looked at trying to create ultra-thin DSEC donor tissue, whereby we minimize the amount of overlying stroma to sort of approach the visual outcomes associated with DMEX surgery, but still have this sort of ease of DSEC surgery. And so um, in this project, basically what we did is um, modify our standard approach, which is to use a microkeratome in preparation of donor tissue. And um, Usually using the microkeratome, we take the full thickness cornea, which is mounted in um, an artificial anterior chamber, pass the microkeratome over, and basically leave behind a stromal bed with underlying decimase membrane endothelium. Typically, our um, stromal bed approaches a thickness of approximately 150 microns. But with the double pass technique, our idea is to basically shave down a second time in order to permit minimal um, stromal tissue overlying decimase membrane. And so this was a fun project to do, mainly because we were able to collect the data in one relatively long afternoon, but it was very satisfying to sort of see this project be completed from start to finish. And what we were able to do is look at 11 um, human corneal scleral rims donated by our eye bank and mounted in the um, artificial anterior chamber I mentioned and use a bare pair microkeratome in order to um, produce this ultra-thin tissue. So. Um, the way that our study was designed, we had access to several different depths of microkeratome heads. Typically in the OR in practice, we have access to a 300 or a 350 micron um, cutting head. But in collaborating with uh, Moria, we were able to get access to different cutting heads. And so for the superficial free, free cap that we created as demonstrated here, um, we were able to use four different cutting heads um, and then we basically created a second pass um, which resulted in this intralamellar stromal lenticule and in order for that pass we were able to use either 110 or 130 micron cutting head and basically we would be left with the donor's visual stromal bed, very thin layer of stroma with decimase membrane endothelium. So um, in doing this you can see the histology that beautifully demonstrates epithelium with stroma, stroma alone and then finally a thin bit of stroma with decimase membrane and endothelium. When we tried to compare the depth of the uh, microkeratome cutting head with the thickness, we saw that generally, as you can imagine, the thicker the cutting head, the thicker the cut. But what's interesting to note is there was a little bit of variability between the cut um, that was anticipated and the, micron, uh, the, the depth of the cutting head. Namely, when it was a thinner cutting head, we were a little bit closer, although here sort of the numbers were varied. But as you generally increase, you can see here using a 350 micron cutting head, our average cut was actually 467, whereas using a 200 micron cutting head, our average cut was 210, keeping in mind that the numbers were very low, and so clearly you would need more data in order to have a stronger claim as to the consistency of the depth of the micro cutting, micron, uh, microkeratome cutting head. The other important factor to notice is that um, when you pass the microkeratome, the the pressure of the artificial anterior chamber is very important because any changes of fluctuation in the pressure definitely affect the thickness of cut that you're able to produce and we see that clinically when preparing our donor tissue. And so um, in a series of OCT imaging we can see here that this is the virgin cornea with this relatively um, uniform profile that we expect as it grows thicker as we move to the periphery. 
And here is the residual stromal bed after the first microkeratin cutting had passed. And you can see that it's largely maintaining the same sort of contour and consistency, um, namely that the, the center is the thinnest and sort of grows thicker as we extend outward. And that trend was maintained as we performed the second microkeratin cutting um, pass. And so looking at resum residual stromal bed thickness as far as actual quantitation, we can see that as the um, various uh, residual stromal thicknesses arise, there's uniformity across and there's more variation the thicker the re residual stromal bed thickness. You might also notice here that we're pretty high up in the numbers and this is a reflection of the fact that the donor tissue that we used wasn't quite necessarily the freshest and so it became a benefit with time. But I still think that there's value in learning that because certainly our colleagues who use this tissue internationally or may not have access to the freshest tissue can still work with tissue using two microkeratome passes in order to produce a relatively thin end product. So in the data that we collected, we developed an algorithm that basically looks at uh, the thickness of the um, tissue. And so what we propose is if the initial micro, uh, if the initial um, pachymetry measures between 500 and 600 microns, you would probably best to use a 250 micron cutting head, whereas if it's thicker, you're better off using a um, deeper microkeratome cutting head. And then subsequently, um, regardless of which you use in this range, you're probably, it's best to be conservative with a 110 micron cutting head, but the 130 micron cutting head might be most appropriate when the residual stromal bed after the first pass is still greater than 300 microns. Any questions? Yes. We didn't, we didn't, but that definitely would be the next step, obtaining fresher tissue and being able to do not only vital staining, but I think that specular microscopy would be advantageous as well. Right. Absolutely. So more or less, we basically tried to use a tonal pen between passes to make sure that we were sort of in the same range. Although when we did the experiment, it seemed like a good idea to make it nice and firm. So we were actually aiming for pressures around 55, 60. But one could make the argument that maybe you should be a little bit more physiologic when making your passes just to maintain the health of the endothelium. We actually were, we did get one perforation. And in that case, it was because the residual stromal bed was still so thick that we were a little bit on the greedy side and still wanted to pass one more time. Um, and it was the third pass that resulted in perforation. Um, so uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some uh, a case report of um, CTK or central toxic keratopathy after LASIK. And so this was an interesting case of a 58-year-old woman who presented with not too uh, unusual of a um, myopic correction. And so um, she underwent LASIK, which by all means was considered pretty standard. And postoperative week one, she was noted to be hyperopic with a plus 125 on the right and a plus 250 on the left. And clinically, she presented with this sort of haze um, across a linear pattern on the front of the eye, um, where the, the um, underneath the LASIK flap. And so as we followed her over time, um, she had the diagnosis of central toxic keratopathy. And we noted that preoperatively, she had pachymetry that sort of dipped down and then slowly, gradually made its way back up, um, both in the left and the right eye. And as far as her refraction was concerned, she definitely had a hyperopic shift that slowly came back. Um, and you can see that her vision was correctable sort of after the first month. And so um, gathering data with this patient, we tried to glean more information about understanding what is really going on in this principle of central toxic keratopathy. Um, and so here, looking at um, some of the Pentacam data, we can see that if we look at the posterior curvature, as to be expected, it's pretty constant. And that makes sense, because certainly we're doing refractive surgery on the anterior portion of the cornea, we wouldn't expect changes on the posterior curvature. But as we looked at the anterior tangential curvature, we can see that there was a, this swift change where at week one, it definitely became more flat and then gradually increased in curvature. Um, this we tried to correlate with looking at the pachymetry. And so we can see that the thickness dropped down immediately and then slowly had this increase in thickness of cornea um, over time. 
looking at OCT imaging, we can see here, this is sort of in the initial uh, first week period, we can see there's this hyperreflective area underneath the flap um, that resolves with time. This is sort of at month three, um, and where you can see that not only is this hyperreflective area gone, but the sort of delineation between where the underlying stroma and the flap is sort of decreased as well. And so our hypothesis is that this may have re reflected localized inflammation associated, yes, question. Yes, so here you can see here, yeah, yeah, that was postoperatively, no problem. So it was that haze that was underneath the LASIK flap. And so we see these images um, that changed. Unfortunately, we weren't able to obtain very good um, specular microscopy images because it would have been very interesting to see if we could actually see the inflammatory cells located within the stroma. Since publishing this paper, there has been another <coughs> paper that's come out in the French literature that does talk about this um, case of CPK where they are able to do specular imaging. And basically, if you look at the image, it's black splotch with like these teeny white punctate spots, which they propose are inflammatory cells like macrophages that are in um, that area. And so um, from looking at this patient, we concluded that the majority of the corneal tissue loss occurred mainly in the first postoperative week. However, in order to fully understand the disease mechanism, it's important that we had m important to have more um, postoperative data, especially early on. And it would have been particularly helpful had we obtained an OCT image of this patient before the onset of this um, disease process. Of course, confocal microscopy would have been helpful as well. And um, ultra, very high frequency ultrasound would be something that would be interesting as well to sort of delineate where that inflammation is and how it changes over time. Yes, please. I'm always confused how this is different than if the disease from an actual esophagy is as presented as a flap falling in places. But there's, there's been arguments going both ways as to actually the degree of difference in different actual results. Why is it different in reason to be clearly and etiologically inflammatory variation? Well, um, I personally think it's within a spectrum of DLK and this sort of represents the endpoint. I think we don't have enough information as far as on a cellular level to be able to differentiate why is this not just an extreme form of DLK, which I kind of think it is. And in order to get that information, I think if we had more s data, we'd probably have a better understanding. As far as what the inciting factor is, I think once upon a time when we were using blades to make flaps, it certainly made sense that perhaps the mechanical chatter of the blade itself was causing a lot of local inflammation. But now that we're using the interlays, I'm not really clear as to why the mechanical separation would be pro-inflammatory. Do you have any comments, Dr. Michelle? Um, I mean, I, I understand the inflammatory variation, but what's the point of the inflammatory variation? Like, what's the point of DLK-like When we looked at the OCT imaging, to us it seemed like, well, first it seemed like most people thought that this was just an issue that was happening underneath the flap. But our feeling was that looking at the imaging, it actually involved the flap itself and that there was stromal changing, changes going on, that the thickening wasn't just at the epithelial level but in the stroma itself.
that's very interesting. Okay. Kendra. I think that's that's a valid concern. Usually, they you can do hopefully specular microscopy to sort of see what the state of the endothelium is. I think that circumstance is sort of unusual because most standard tissue that you receive from the eye bank at the time of transplantation is not going to be that thick. However, there was a case um, the first six months of my uh, road fellowship where the um, tissue that we received from the eye bank actually had deepithelialized, and so there was market thickening of the. I mean, certainly not to the extent of 800 microns. But that is a circumstance where perhaps the tissue that you receive is a bit thicker than you would expect, and it's good to know how to handle that tissue as well. Yes, that, that was documented, but I'm not sure that it was necessarily reflective of what the cell count may have been at the time of, uh, of, at the time of using the tissue. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit more clinically instead of uh, experimental. And this is a paper looked at the use of DSEC for treating endothelial, patient, uh, endothelial failure in patients who had <laughs> penetrating keratoplasty. And if you were to do a literature search, <coughs> you would see that there was a flurry of papers that were published at the same time um, regarding this topic. So definitely a lot of institutions are sim thinking along the same lines. And so um, in our study, we were able to evaluate 22 consecutive eyes in 19 patients who had undergone previous um, penetrating keratoplasty and then had DSEC following uh, that. Their mean preoperative vision, visual acuity was 2180. And there were actually eight cases that received, achieved a best corrected visual acuity of better than 2040. And I think it's important to take a moment just to step back and look at that and say, well, are we really doing a service to these patients if only 36, about a third? of these patients are s having vision that's better than 2040. And I think it's important to note that these patients are not your standard, like, oh, they had a little bit of fluke, so now they're having a DSEC, and they're you know, expecting vision to be 2020 or 2025. These are patients who've had likely several surgeries, who may have different amounts of scarring, may have retinal disease as well. And so um, in some cases, the, e the reason for us to do the DSEC was more therapeutic, simply for comfort, to treat bolus changes that were causing patient a lot of pain. And so this was not a study that was meant to try and highlight um, great visual outcomes. It was meant to sort of reflect our experience, which was dealing with very complicated patients who had failed PKPs. Um, and of the patients that we evaluated, only one was noted to have a partial dislocation, uh, which is a dislocation rate of 4.5%, which is excellent when compared to similar results in the literature. Of note, uh, and if you were to review sort of the papers that were published at the same time. Noteworthy changes or um, differences in our paper were the fact that the grafts were considered or were designed as to being the same size as the failed PKP, whereas some papers um, proposed that maybe having a larger DSEC graft would be advantageous. Others proposed that maybe being having a smaller would be better because if you're avoiding that sort of graft host junction, then you might limit the amount or the possibility of that graft dislocating because of an uneven edge against which it's placed. Um, in our patients, we did not remove or scrape Desmase membrane, and there's definitely some controversy in the literature as to the benefit of scraping. There are some people who really swear that scraping the um, base stroma really it helps as far as making um, adherence of the donor tissue improved. However, in our um, experience, we don't do that and didn't do that with these cases. Uh, however, all of our patients had paracentral venting incisions, and um, this is something that is part of our standard clinical practice and uh, we believe allows us to ensure that the graft is in good position. And um, while other 
techniques involve using forceps to introduce the tissue. We used a glide um, pulling technique using a 4.5 uh, millimeter incision at the limbus. And so here is an example of one of our patients who had um, successful defect after penetrating keratoplasty. And here you can see on the OCT how beautiful um, the image is where you can see the actual graft host interface of the um, defect tissue as it nicely opposes to where the PKP is. And you can see the margin of the suture here and a little bit over here. Yes. Dr. McKim? <laughs> okay, um, so now we're going to change gears a little bit, um, moving from the phakic IOLs, which of course we know are FDA approved, to these new color iris implants uh, in phakic eyes, which are actual plastic discs which are inserted into the anterior chamber in order to pr um, produce a cosmetic change. This is not FDA approved, as you can imagine, actually um, has been uh, proposed by an ophthalmologist in Panama. And so um, we had a little bit of experience um, in the management of patients who had uh, this implant placed and then um, unfortunately experienced decompensation. In particular, we had a 19-year-old who presented with complaints of subjective vision decrease and he had had uh, bilateral blue and new color iris implants done in Panama the week before. His vision was 20-30 at the time of presentation. His pressures were normal. Um, however, on gonioscopy there were evidence, there was evidence of early PAS in several quadrants, and um, the implants basically looked like they were lodged in the angle. And uh, given the fact that flare and pigmented cells were um, present, we had a long discussion with the patient and proposed taking out the implant. So this is a schematic of the surgical technique that we used. The plastic is basically like a flimsy, floppy plastic, but there is still some um, uh, rigidity to it. And so what we um, proposed and what we did was basically make a um, clear corneal wound and then um, basically cut through the implant uh, approximately 180 degrees away. And then after doing so, continue rotating the graft within the anterior chamber in order to create third sections, which could then be removed through the um, clear corneal incision. And the idea, of course, doing this under distal elastic is to try and minimize trauma to the anterior segment and the cornea while removing this implant. And this is a sample of what it looked like and you can see here it's pretty flimsy looking um, and more importantly you can see that maybe this is where we cut it and we can be responsible for some jaggedness but this is the actual edge of the implant and unfortunately in reviewing sort of uh, experiences 
in what's published, and that's more published in the lay literature, apparently the surgeons who do this um, sometimes, yes. pardon? Customize. Exactly, customize, yes. Yes. Oh, the new color iris implant? Yes. Okay. Okay. What is the consistency of this compared to that silicone? I thought mm -hmm. this one is silicone too? I don't know. I'm not sure. The one I just tried. The one that you showed us before sort of has like a rubbery silicone feel to it. And have you used the other one? Because my impression is that this one is a little bit more plasticky. Is that incorrect? I see. Hmm. Yeah. No, this does not does not look like a tree sign at all. Unfortunately, yeah. I actually had a patient when I was in residency, she came and she had this form and she asked that I fill it out and it basically said that she was gonna have this implant done. And I said, you know, did they tell you to come here to Wilmer? She's like, no, they told me to come to go to Walmart to get an eye exam, but she ended up at Wilmer. And so we had a long discussion <laughs> about how it was just not a good idea to have this done. And she was upset because she came and she wanted her form filled out so she could have this done. And it was just, I mean, you, try rationalizing and the response you'll get, my friend did it. And that's sort of the end of the discussion because you're dealing with someone who's like 19 and really is interested in having their eye color changed. And so it's definitely frustrating here. So the, the treatment of rugby, you, you discovered that Dave Johnson had been doing genitals rugby during you were basically experimenting with doing bilateral and then working with the three of us on the UCL to straighten it. Ended up being an implant that was in one eye and a genital in the other. It was a nice Absolutely. It's very true. Sorry, sorry. No. 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 Okay. Right. Good. Several thousand. Yes, it's like five thousand dollars to drive around and have it put in. And in essence, there was no hiccup no. prior. They just basically said the name. They just hooked on with a screw and pulled it up, plug it in, and turned it back on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, Khan, Dr. Khan.
Yes. Um, okay, so that being said, uh, this is just a little sort of pearl for the residents. So we wrote this beautiful paper and we included what was pretty scant, but what was the review in the literature. And when we submitted it, it the, the feedback we received is this is great, but you have too much literature review. Um, so basically we just took the paper and reformatted it into two. And so that's how I was able to get another paper out of this year. And so um, here's a picture actually, Dr. Kendall, of the patient. Um, yeah, right. And you can tell how stunningly handsome he looks with those implants. Wow, I would totally yeah, understand why someone would want to pay $5,000 for that. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. It looks ghoulish. And not only that, you can see that the placement here, the light reflex is centered in the pupil, and you can see where it is here. So, I mean, it's just, it's atrocious to think that these things are being implanted. And it's very sad to think that people think that this is attractive enough to risk their vision for. Um, so basically, if you do look at the literature, um, looking at patients who had different implants put in, it's available in blue and green. Um, the onset of symptoms range from anywhere from a week to six months. And you can see at the time, um, endothelial cell density was measured in some patients. I mean, some people dropped down, 19 and 21 year olds dropping down to less than 1,000. Um, it's just, it, it's really, really sad that this is going on. Um, this is a Pentacam image demonstrating basically that this is just shoved into the angle. And you can see that it's just sitting on the iris shoved there. Um, yeah, right, so this is not what Dr. Kendall is talking about. Um, paper number nine, this was a little review article on um, the soft tech lens, which I think is worthwhile sharing because we do actually have access to it now in the operating room. And basically this is designed as a um, aspheric lens that is um, acrylic. The idea is that there would be less dysphotopsia and the biocompatibility and clarity is good and that ho hopefully it's resistant to damage during insertion. Actually, I had a chance to implant one of these a couple of weeks ago and it is a very, very, very gummy lens. I mean, it almost doesn't want to stay rolled for that short time that you're inserting it and it just flops and unfolds um, immediately. And so the theory um, behind zero aberration is that um, an average, the mean corneal spherical of aberration is about a quarter um, micron. And so most patients have positive um, corneal spherical aberration. And so if you implant a zero aberration lens, you don't necessarily have to worry about alignment errors, which can be a factor in a placement of other lenses. Um, and the other interesting thing about this lens is it comes in quarter diopter increments um, in this 18 to 25 range and then half diopter um, increments in that broader range and one diopter even in the higher ranges, um, extremes. And so that allows a little bit more custom tuning as far as um, providing um, optimized uh, visual outcomes to our patients. And so, okay, whew, that was nine papers. And there are a few more that are in review, so I didn't want to jinx it and put it up here because you never know. Um, but right. I think it's been out on the market probably about two years, so not that long. I don't. No, sorry. Any other thoughts on this paper? Um, so I just wanted to take a moment. I mean, this has been a phenomenal year. You, so you can see I've had a chance to do amazing surgery, work with amazing people, and 
uh, participate in a lot of really nice research projects. And I think what I want to share is, obviously it's been a busy year, and as all of the faculty know, balancing academics definitely is a challenge. It requires time management. And what I found most wonderful is the opportunity to collaborate and delegate, because it really does make a tremendous um, help in trying to get these projects done. Um, I think the joke among the fellows has been, oh, if only we could get a fellow to help us with some of our work, we'd be, <laughs> we'd be in good shape. Um, and so what I wanted to share with the residents, as far as my experience over the past year, I think you know, every project sort of has a different scope. And the easiest way, or the, I think the most efficient way is to sort of frame a question. What is it that you want this paper to um, share with you know, your scientific colleagues? Um, but more importantly, I think it's important to have a modest goal. I definitely know that we all are aware of certain projects that you may get involved in, and they become sort of bigger and bigger and more ominous as time goes by. But I think the projects that sort of have modest goals to begin with are definitely the ones that sort of have the best um, chance of being successful and something that you can be proud of because you feel like you've worked on it from start to finish. And I think sometimes what gets overlooked is actually taking the time to review what's in the literature because there is so much out there. And I think, you know, keeping up with scientific proceedings is not what it used to be. I mean, there are so many ophthalmology journals and there are so many papers and now there's online publishing and, and it's hard to keep up. But when you set your uh, mind to a certain task, it's important to know what's out there, know the audience, and that way you can sort of focus your efforts. So I'd like to take a moment to share some acknowledgments. I mean, clearly this year could not have been possible without the support of Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Moskvar. And Dr. Newfer was a tremendous co-fellow that I really do appreciate. I'm having the Moran faculty staff have been amazing. I wish I could take all of you back with me. Um, in particular, Monette. <laughs> if you know Monette in uh, the laser suite and the OR, she's phenomenal. Um, the Moran residents have been wonderful to work with. I really have not dreaded being on call because it's been delightful working with all of you. Um, in particular, Krista, Tom, Derek, and Lloyd have participated in some research projects with me, and I really do appreciate their contributions. Um, Jeff Petty is about to be mentioned because he's working on something now, but I'll see what his turnaround time is. Um, and then as far as medical students are concerned, I've been really lucky that I've had a chance to work with some really intelligent, motivated medical students. Um, Lisa, I'm sorry I forgot to put your name up there, but Lisa Leishman is one of the incoming PATH fellows, and so you'll have a chance to get to know her over the year. Um, and she's phenomenal as well. My female fellows, that's what we kind of call ourselves, and Mark, um, <laughs> it's been <laughs> great to have. Uh, such a wonderful group to sort of survive the year with. And also my family's been tremendously supportive. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. And this would be a chance for anyone to make an escape because I'm going to show some winning pictures. Minimum 10 times. Okay, so you had your chance, Dr. Mifflin. Here you go, round 17. So as some of you may know, I got married on April 9th this year, and it was wonderful, um, in particular because Dr. Mifflin let me have some time off, and that was much appreciated. And so here I am with my family, my parents and my sister, and we actually had, as you can imagine, several events. And this was the one um, the day before the wedding, which actually took place at our house. And so this is me being escorted out by my cousins. Everyone's matching. Here we are up on stage. That's my groom. And you can see he's pretty happy, which is good, a good sign. Um, and then this is actually the day of the wedding, the next day, the wedding ceremony where we're exchanging rings. And then there we are for the reception. And um, here is a photo. Uh, we uh, had this stage set up, and so everyone sort of, uh, as is custom in the evening, comes 